the opening of the 19th CPC National Congress, General Secretary Xi Jinping introduced the concept of China entering a new era. Why did he, what did he mean by that and what does it mean to people around the world? And as scientists celebrate the discovery of so-called gravitational waves from a collision of neutron stars, I'll be asking why this is important and why should anyone care. Welcome to The Point, live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. Every five years, the Chinese Communist Party holds its National Congress. This month, the 19th Congress opens in Beijing. It will elect a new central leadership and chart the course for the party as well as the country over the next five years and beyond. Who will step into the party's top leadership, the Politburo Standing Committee? Will the Congress look to amend the party constitution? Which direction will the anti-corruption campaign be heading? How will the CPC manage the Chinese economy, foreign affairs and military? Tune in to CTTN for all the answers as the CPC decides. China has entered a new era with new opportunities and new challenges. Xi Jinping, General Secretary of the CPC Central Committee, told the world Wednesday morning during a three-and-a-half-hour report at the opening session of the 19th National Congress of the CPC. The meeting sets a blueprint for national development and diplomacy for the next five years and beyond and has been highly anticipated both at home and abroad. During his speech, Xi Jinping said socialism with China Chinese characteristics has crossed the threshold into a new era, an era of securing a decisive victory in building a moderately prosperous society in all aspects and of moving on to all-out efforts to build a great modern socialist country. What is this new era and what does it mean to people around the world? I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Professor Fu Jing, Professor of Political Economy at Peking University and in Shanghai by Joseph Mahoney, Professor of Politics at the East China Normal University. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Professor Mahoney, let me come to you first. What is your Thank understanding you. of the phrase new era of socialism with Chinese char characteristics? What has actually changed in the Chinese society? society that qualify for this new term? Well, I think the first thing that we know is that, you know, China has been building for many years towards this 2020 development goal of a moderately prosperous society. And we're going to cross that threshold within the next five-year time frame. I think that's the first key point. But we're also uh, uh, at a point now where uh, Xi Jinping is ready to put his name and his reputation on this, on this uh, generation and to lead us uh, forward after this very strong uh, uh, party rectification campaign towards reforms that aim at uh, making economic uh, reforms like moving from, uh, as he said today, an FDI-led to an innovation-led economy and so forth and so on. Professor Fu, do you understand with what uh, Professor Mahoney was saying and uh, your understanding of this new saying of a new era in comparison with uh, what was termed in the past? I, I fairly agree with uh, uh, him, uh, but to put the, uh, the point in a uh, longer historical context, uh, the whole reform process uh, from the perspective of Chinese leadership is defined as uh, an initial stage of uh, uh, construction of the socialism. Uh, now we have moved from uh, a GDP per capita, the level of GDP per capita of a few uh, hundred dollars to, to uh, something like eight uh, thousand US dollars. And for us to continue to move, it's like the last lap you have to uh, go through so that uh, you reach uh, the stage of uh, so-called the moderately prosperous uh, society. So that's why he also said, well, this is the stage uh, uh, for us to uh, have decisive uh, victory. Now, this is the domestic scene. Internationally, uh, recently, China has been uh, increasingly moved to the center of uh, international uh, affairs and it's because partly because the size of the Chinese economy and we have uh, to uh, take more responsibilities uh, so if you combine uh, the two dimensions both the international and the domestic dimension and also uh, including the consideration that uh, as uh, the party's uh, number one and he has to make up 
mark on the Chinese history. So all these uh, give rise to the concept of a new era of uh, the construction of uh, socialism with the Chinese uh, char characteristics. Yes, but, yes, the timing <coughs> is also very interesting as we understand that uh, President, uh, General Secretary of the CPC Xi Jinping is expected to uh, take on his second term as leader of the party. Why do you think he's coining or he's using this term at this particular moment, Professor Fu? Well, it's uh, during it's sort of he's preparing for the uh, set second term uh, of uh, his leadership. Uh, during the first term, uh, the blueprint, uh, to put it in very simple way, China need to uh, accomplish uh, years down the road two principal tasks. One is uh, we need to set up a various uh, various. Uh, serious system of uh, rule of law. This is sort of uh, the political construction. The other is uh, China need to take the market very seriously. In other words, we have built up a very uh, competitive markets of goods and services. China has yet to build a very co competitive markets of uh, factors of production resources, in other words. Uh, now, during the first term, uh, a lot of energy has been put into anti-corruption campaigns and there is a point uh, to make that because mm -hmm. for the Chinese Communist Party to lead. Uh, you have to uh, be in the position of uh, leadership and uh, that uh, requires that the organization need to be uh, clean. And uh, so that as uh, a uh, strategy of uh, sequencing, it probably makes sense uh, to clean up the party first so that uh, once the direction is set, he has a organization to operationalize uh, the two, what I see, the two principal tasks uh, that China uh, is yet to accomplish. Yeah, for our international audiences, however, this is also a very important subject as there are multiple implications for this terminology, uh, especially for the international audience as to other countries in the world. President um, General Secretary Xi also made the following remarks. Let's take a listen. It means that the path, the theory, the system, and the culture of socialism with Chinese characteristics have kept developing, blazing a new trail for other developing countries to achieve modernization. It offers a new option for other countries and nations who want to speed up their development while preserving their independence. And it offers Chinese wisdom and a Chinese approach to solving the problems facing mankind. Professor Mahoney, what does China entering a new era mean in terms of opportunities for other developing countries and for the developed world? Well, I think it's clear that for many years the, the world was under a certain paradigm or a certain idea that uh, used to be referred to as the Washington Consensus. And that, uh, what, what, what has emerged in China is an alternative path of development. Some people called it the China model for a while. Um, the Chinese leaders themselves never really went that far. They, they also contended that what China does is very unique to China and isn't really portable uh, necessarily to other countries. Nevertheless, there are, I think, uh, I think there are two key points to draw from what he says. The first is that um, China is taking a different path and other countries, particularly developing countries, might learn from that path. And the second key point is that they don't necessarily have to follow the old development model that, that didn't necessarily work for them. Yeah, but uh, Professor Fu, explain a bit further, what are the differences then between the Chinese way, Chinese path, or Chinese wisdom or solutions, whatever term you use, and the traditional Western approach to dealing with global problems? When I use the word wisdom, and when, when Chinese use the wisdom, uh, it indicates uh, that you probably have some uh, general directions, uh, but when you move from A to B, you need to be, uh, to be very sensitive to local uh, conditions uh, to figure out ways. So in a way, it's more biological than uh, Newtonian. And in t that's why we say we have our own uh, path. Uh, if you look at the world history, all countries have their own path, one way or the other. It's a matter of uh, degrees. We have our own uh, theoretical framework. That means the theoretical framework is not uh, static, and it, it, it has uh, sort of uh, to be evolving. And you sort of have uh, final exams. You also have midterm exams so that once you have five years, you need to sit down to do uh, assessment, and you need to make an adjustment because it's a large country. Uh, now, if we say uh, a China model, uh, 
Westerners tend to use that, but in China, if you open up uh, the black box of China again, you see uh, different models. For instance, uh, in Zhejiang, you have a more market-oriented model. In Shanghai, it's a more foreign capital-oriented model. And in uh, Suzhou, it's more state uh, dominant model, but uh, di during different uh, period of time, different models uh, probably will uh, be superior than others. But as I said, when you traveled over so uh, some time, you need to uh, have a assessment. And China also uh, advise other countries is you do not have to copy us, but uh, there are general lessons we can learn, and for countries to develop the policies you design have to be very sensitive to yeah. local conditions. Basically, basically the key word is very important is to st speed up the development while preserving their independence. I think that is uh, uh, said very clearly there. Professor Mahoney, as we're looking at opportunities, there are also challenges. For instance, some international media are concerned that as China becomes uh, stronger, becomes modernized, it would start exporting its ideology, a potential threat to the rest of the so-called democracy-dominated world. What is your take on that? I think that's far-fetched. I think China has made it very clear that it doesn't want to intervene in other people's political systems and that, it, that its political system isn't something that would necessarily fit anyone else. At the same time, um, you know, it's, it's clearly the case that, um, that China, as, as Xi Jinping said today, is moving from being simply a major country to a major power. And as it does this, uh, it certainly is competing in the arena of soft power and um, that's a little bit different from trying to export your ideology and your political system. It's about simply trying to take your place in the world and protect your own uh, rights and opportunities. Mm -hmm. Professor Fu, I have about one minute here. Tell me, is China or should China be expected to take on greater responsibilities that is entering a new era? Is China ready or should, be, should China be expected to do that? Well, from international society, uh, people are expecting China to play a big role and uh, internally, uh, as a rising uh, power, China should play a big uh, role in international affairs, especially uh, when you see there are backlashes against globalization and for the global economy uh, to continue to grow, we need to have uh, uh, leadership and China should step up and in coordination with other uh, major powers. Thank you very much, Professor Fu Jing uh, from the National School of Development at Peking University and Joseph Mahoney, Professor of Politics at the East China Normal University. Well, I think it is true that as China enters into a new era and becoming more modernized and stronger, China should take up a greater part in leading in leadership role in the world. However, President, uh, however, General Secretary Xi Jinping of the CPC Central Committee also made it very clear that for a long time, China will remain at the initial stage of socialism and China is still and will m remain for the next uh, foreseeable future the largest developing country in the world. So do not expect China to lead everybody else anytime soon. China will play a very important role but every country should still be looking for their right place in the world now and in the near future. And you have been watching The Point with me, Lishi. We'll take a short break and we'll be back right after this with a very different topic. Scientists officially announced on Monday the detection of gravitational waves, cosmic ripples that distort the very fabric of space and time that were predicted by Albert Einstein more than a century ago. The waves came from the collision of two neutron stars in a galaxy called NGC 4993, located about 130 million light years away from Earth. Detection of uh, gravitational waves is not something new, as astronomers have observed several incidences of uh, gravitational waves from mergers of black holes, but it was the first time that scientists could match gravitational waves with a visible source. The discovery is accomplished by one of the most ambitious physics uh, experiments in decades, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, in collaboration with their international counterparts. Now, as scientists are celebrating their new finding, we'll be asking what it means for physics and how it could affect the lives of ordinary people and what will be the next big thing. I'm pleased to be joined from Los Angeles by Chen Yan Bei, professor of physics at the California Institute of Technology and also a member of the LIGO scientific collaboration. And here in Beijing by Zhang Fan, associate professor of uh, astronomy at Beijing Normal University. Gentlemen, very pleased to have you on the show. Uh, first of all, Professor Chen, can we start 
by defining or helping to explain what exactly are gravitational waves and why has so much effort been expended globally for decades to detect them? Uh, good evening. Uh, gravitational waves are predicted by Einstein um, in his uh, general theory of relativity. Um, in general relativity, um, Einstein describes gravity in terms of the geometry of space-time. And then uh, gravitational waves are basically when objects that generate gravity, when they move and oscillate, uh, the curvature of space-time they generate would um, propagate through the universe away at the speed of light. So this is gravitational waves. It's very important because it's a very, imp um, because it's a very important part of Einstein theory that says that space-time uh, not only can be curved, but also that curvature can propagate. It's just like distortions in membranes can propagate because of elasticity. Uh, gravitational waves propagate because space and time is like a membrane. It has kind of uh, rigidity. <laughs> so physicists have been looking for that because we would like to understand the fundamental theory of space and time. Sure. Professor Zhang, now this is the fifth time scientists have observed gravitational waves, but the previous detections came from the collision of black holes, as I said. So what's special about these waves detected this time? Well, this time the uh, source of the gravitational waves is the collision, is the collision between two neutron stars. Uh, these are basically very dense stars at the end of the, uh, the life of, uh, of ordinary stars. Um, so they're um, they're extremely dense in the sense that uh, we know that we're all made of atoms, but in the atoms there's a very dense core, nucleus, and then the, uh, you have electrons flowing around it, and uh, it's basically mostly empty space, so we're actually mostly empty space. But neutron stars are actually made almost entirely of nuclear matter. Uh, one teaspoon of that thing it weighs uh, a billion tons. That's not a hyperbole, it actually weighs a billion tons. Um, so it can also generate very strong gravitational waves, just like black holes. However, you also have nuclear physics going on in there. So you, by observing the, the uh, gravitational waves and the uh, electromagnetic counterparts, you actually learn something about nuclear physics and electromagnetism and other things. Mm -hmm. so, so this is very different yeah. uh, in that respect. Yeah, Professor Chen, now I know scientists from around the world have spent decades, right, a lot of money uh, to try to detect these gravitational waves directly. Uh, why has it been so difficult and why only most recently these dif discoveries have been made? Um, gravity is a very weak um, interaction. So, and gravitational waves, even caused by the motion of black holes, are very tiny. So these gravitational waves that we have detected, uh, they move uh, mirrors, these test objects, by 10 to the minus 18 meters. So it's a very, very small displacement, and you need very precise, very uh, sensitive device to measure them. And the technology was just not available until recently. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the detection is said to have put an end to a century of speculation and uh, confirmed Einstein's theory of relativity. Professor Chen, uh, when he was alive, actually, he was known sometimes to have been doubtful of his own prediction. So what's the significance from your perspective of uh, the uh, detection for physics? And even this year's Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to three uh, physics uh, for their work in this field. So for physics, it's really, you know, when you have a general relativity, it's a complete theory that has many predictions. And you only after you test all of the major uh, predictions can you say that now we have a picture um, that's complete where um, gravity is indeed described by the geometry of space-time. And so for physicists, it's really important to have a fully uh, consistent theory for that reason. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, in this can time we when we say have that um, now? electromagnetic Professor Chen, waves... Professor Chen, and, can uh, we safely mm -hmm. say that now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with these detections, can we safely make that well, conclusion? To s well, we can make that conclusion to a certain accuracy, and there's a qualitative difference between what we know before and what we know now, because now we are sure the waves exist, mm -hmm. they propagate, they interact with the device that we build on Earth. So, you know, and then quantitatively, um, you test it to a certain accuracy. But of course, as physicists, we always hope that, you know, there's always something more to it. You yeah. know, maybe after you test relativity up to a certain accuracy, you will find some deviations, 
and that will be new physics, um, and that will be uh, new research for the future generations. <laughs> but up till now, yeah. we have tested what Einstein predicted up to a good accuracy. I see. Professor Chang, it's reported that the study of the neutron stars has led to a greater understanding of the origins of heavy metals, such as gold, you know, in, in, in the rings and in, in the jewelry that people wear. Uh, why is this information relevant? Uh, well, first of all, it satisfies curi curiosity of people, I suppose, uh, <laughs> you know, besides biological needs. And it adds a nice story to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also, um, for gold in particular, I guess, uh, if, if, you, if you know where it comes from, you can, uh, I guess, if you push me to say something like uh, use for it, then uh, you can predict how much gold there should be on Earth and whether... Uh, Gold price will keep appreciating in the future. <laughs> well, you don't I don't have to say that. that <laughs> I'm not going to push yeah. you to say yeah. that. <laughs> but uh, let, let, let's talk about, um, <laughs> yeah, let's po talk about the relevancy of this discovery for ordinary people's lives in general, Professor Zhang. Why uh, should we care about the discovery, or about the existence of these waves? Right. So first of all. Um, the, 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 more, the more immediate payoff is the spin-off technology from the de detector itself. It's basically a, a precision measuring device. So any sort of precision manufacturing can use that sort of technology. And then also through the gravitational waves, we can start learning about the universe. About, for example, the, uh, uh, the nuclear matter, when it's extremely dense, what kind of properties they would have. And this sort of information would have relevance for nuclear, for nuclear reactors and unfortunately nuclear bombs as well. So I don't know whether it's a good thing, but it's definitely a relevant thing, unfortunately. Uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's very one thing that I have noticed about this uh, whole story is the international relay, let's say, of observations of scientists and telescopes from around the world in the weeks after the gravitational waves were detected on uh, August the 17th. Some 100 uh, telescopes detected the, the the waves all around the world, even uh, telescopes in Antarctica. So, Professor Chen, uh, what international collaboration? collaborations were carried out this time and how important were these efforts? Um, so the collaboration formed a few years ago because as astrophysicists already anticipate that after mergings, mergers of neutron stars there will be these electromagnetic counterparts. And so they set up a collaboration of 70, more than 70 observatories, um, signed a contract with uh, LIGO and Virgo so that LIGO and Virgo will give out uh, triggers, alerts to them after once a gravitational wave is detected and then they can go search for it. And that's, you know, anticipated to be very important because astronomers have been looking, have been theorizing uh, these, um, you know, electromagnetic counterparts for many years. So, and this is uh, really important that they can scramble these, um, their devices in a few hours time or in some cases a few minutes time to try to look for this uh, signature. And what, um, has, yeah, what has been China's role in the whole process? And there is a lot of enthusiasm on the, among the Chinese yes. people to the subject. Why so? Yes, there are two um, observatories um, from China. The one of them is the AST telescope uh, in, the south, uh, in Antarctica. And that's the only fully robotic uh, telescope in the world that is uh, located in Antarctica, Antarctica. And they were able to make observations of this uh, event and make an estimate for the amount of matter uh, ejected from the merger of the neutron stars. And that's, uh, that's uh, you know, it, it's, it's really great because in Antarctica, um, the night can be very long during the Antar Antarctic winter. So it's a great location to be building a telescope that um, in the future would be uh, doing more of these uh, follow-up observations. So it's also great that you know China has this uh, base um, in Antarctica yeah. and it's now um, producing scientific results which have a uh, high relevance. Yeah, and finally... And the other one is... Yeah, go the ahead, please. HXM yeah, go ahead. Yes, sorry. There's the HXMT um, uh, X-ray telescope uh, that is in space that recently launched. And that's one of the earliest, one of the uh, earliest um, uh, Chinese uh, space science projects. And then that one also made an observation of x-rays uh, from this uh, merger. It made constraints on the amount of x-ray emitted from this uh, neutron star uh, binary and it was able to make, uh, you know, uh, constrain the nature of this, um, of this event. Yeah. So it's also a great achievement. Yeah. Fascinating topic. Really one last question in one, uh, 30 seconds please, Professor Chen. What is the next big thing?
oh, we're looking for surprises, you know. Maybe there's other sources of gravitational wave that we have not uh, anticipated. And also we want to look for uh, gravitational waves from space uh, using uh, satellites that are in space looking for gravitational waves from colliding black holes at centers of galaxies. And the other thing is looking for uh, signatures of gravitational waves from the cosmic microwave background, which are some of the earliest lights emitted by uh, things in the universe. And that also gives us uh, signatures of gravitational waves and may tell us about the origin of the universe. Fascinating. Uh, the very best of luck to all the scientists involved in this project. And many thanks to our guest, Chen Yim Bei, Professor of Physics at the California Institute of Technology in Los Angeles, and Zhang Fan, Associate Professor of Astronomy at Beijing Normal University. And here is my last point. Now, one of the most positive things I find about this story is the collaborative efforts made by international teams of researchers. And if nothing else, it would appear that the scientific communities around the world can teach the rest of us a thing or two about the benefits to be gained from working together. Creating international linkages can benefit many of the parties involved, not just by spreading the risk, but also by thinking along different lines, thereby creating a multinational think tank. And that's not forgetting that often political and scientific benefits can be intertwined. In the end, the advantages of international cooperation go way beyond simple economics. It can break down cultural differences, build mutual trust, open up scientific potential worldwide, and not least, inspire future generations, thereby benefiting the whole of mentality, of humanity. That's all from this edition of The Point with Neely Sheen. As always, follow us on Twitter or visit our Facebook page using the handle The Point with Our Legs. Download the application called CGTN Live to watch our show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. You got The Point.